Dr. Jillian Lucas Baker. I'm a professor, a wife, and a mom, and I've struggled with fertility issues. I'm Sonora Joy Allwood, a holistic nurse, health coach, entrepreneur, wife, and mom, and I've also struggled with fertility issues. I'm Rayal Hamilton Romeo. I'm a PR executive, a storyteller, and an adjunct professor. I'm a mom and a travel enthusiast, and I've struggled with fertility issues. Welcome to A Tribe Called Fertility. Welcome everyone to another episode of A Tribe Called Fertility. Today we are talking about maternal mortality. Did you know that American women die in childbirth at a higher rate than any other developed country in the world? It's crazy. And this is not national or daily news. And from our standpoint, we're noticing that more and more Black women are fearful of becoming mothers because of the staggering statistics related to Black maternal mortality. And with all of the resources that we have, the um, amount of medical advancements in this country, country and others, our levels of education, no matter how high our socioeconomic backgrounds are or any other type of demographic, it's still a daily reality in our country. When you have rich and celebrity people like Mariah Carey, Serena Williams, and Beyonce all having pregnancy and childbirth related complications, it should be kind of crazy and also a slap in the face for you to see that even these women with all of their resources and connections are still having issues. And then for the women who do not survive, so the women I just mentioned are all surviving and have their families and are thankful for that. But for the women who do not survive, their family members and partners are raising the children that they have birthed on their own. Additionally, family members and friends may not even know what to say or how to provide support to the surviving partner and his or her children. Just so we all are really aware of how staggering these statistics are in regards to maternal mortality and the disparities that exist in our country. So as of 2018, and this is all uh, the most recent data from the CDC, the overall maternal mortality rate is 17.4 deaths per 100,000 live births. So with that said, Black women are more than double that of white women coming in at 37 deaths per 100,000 live births. Also, Black women are more than three times the rate of maternal mortality uh, for uh, Latina women in this country as well. Another thing that our listeners may not know is that 24% of maternal deaths are happening six or more weeks after a woman gives birth. So I think that a lot of people may think that it happens right after or a couple of days later or in that same week, but more and more women are dying weeks after uh, they have their babies. Also, a huge maternal health researcher, uh, Dr. Neil Shah out of Harvard University has said the following, it's hard to fix something you can't see. Even more conservative estimates, the top line findings verify the concerns of the scientific and medical community. In addition to that, he also said that there are hundreds of preventable pregnancy-related deaths every single year, and this rate appears to be rising and rising. There are stark racial inequalities and in outcomes. In addition to that, the three main causes of death, and again, and again this is CDC statistics, are one, cardiovascular conditions, two, hemorrhage, and three are infection. And so um, as Rayal said earlier as well, in terms of things that we think would be protective factors, so we're finding that education is not a protective factor, your insurance is not a protective factor. Um, Black educated women are likely to have more dire outcomes in terms of their pregnancy and after they deliver. And so here we are uh, again in 2020 with all of these staggering uh, statistics that for me are just, you know, uh, a slap in the face. So just from my standpoint, the numbers actually do correlate to real life experience. Black women, educated women, we are faring less favorable in a childbirth situation. And I 
can't say why. I've had um, traumatic birth experience and me being a nurse didn't even protect me. So um, the one thing I can say is that we are our number one advocates and our loved ones and partners and husbands and wives. And we have to take this matter very serious anytime we enter into for ourselves and for our loved ones. That's really pretty much, you know, what I can say about it because it's just such you know, a terrible situation. And what we can see right now is that we can't trust, you know, anyone else to be there for ourselves, for us. We can't trust others. We have to trust ourselves. The statistics shows in terms of pain, a Black woman has to complain three times before a medical professional will take serious the pain that they're experiencing. And that also plays a part in things like pulmonary embolisms, you know, a woman saying that they cannot breathe, they cannot breathe, they cannot breathe, and that being ignored. You would just think as a layperson outside of the medical field, if someone is saying, I can't breathe, you think that's serious, right? So we really do have to get to the bottom of why these complaints are being ignored. Hence, a tri fertility. We have to tell our stories. I keep saying it's 2020, not like 1820 or 1620 or 1420. I'm really like every day I'm really shocked and in awe that we're talking about this at the amount of women who are losing their lives. Like, I think the last two cases I just heard about on social media were two Black women who both happened to be doctors, women who knew about the medical profession, who could tell you about what it was that they were experiencing, both married, so married, educated, well-off, and medical professionals And none of those factors save them. And it's 2020. To me, I'm like, things should be getting better, not worse. I wholeheartedly agree. Like we have such technological advancements where you have nano surgery now. You have nanotechnology where you have nano robots whom can perform intricate surgeries. So it's just... To me, it's, it's just mind boggling the fact that in a country with all these resources, all of these, you know, technological and scientific advancements, why are we where we are today? I think about the young woman who was on the panel that we moderated last month and she said that her blood pressure was elevated and that she needed yeah. to calm down. And she was like, just give me a chance to catch my breath. Like, I know my body, just give me a chance. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't there, you know, obviously. So like, I don't know like what the interaction was like, but I think, you know, in childbirth, you're all already in this heightened state. And then as a medical professional, assuming you already know what the stakes are. So it's like you have both sides that are like highly charged. I'm just trying to think how you get that relationship to a place where both people trust each other. So that way, you know, yes, we can advocate for ourselves to a certain point. Our partners can advocate for us. How do you get to the point where me as the patient, I'm saying to you as the doctor, there's something wrong. I am in pain. I can't breathe. And that to just be understood and accepted instead of challenged or dismissed. I think also during your, because I had two different experiences with my pregnancy. So with the twins, I was at a clinic where the staff rotated. So the doctors rotated, the nurses rotated every appointment that I had. So I never saw the same people. Interesting. Yeah. I never saw the same people regularly. Um, So for that, in that situation, I think it's more challenging to establish relationships where you're not seeing the same people all the time. So you you might have said something to one doctor or one nurse and then two weeks later uh you're seeing uh some you know someone else i'm just thinking of i told you all this story my second trimester with the twins i gained i think like eight pounds one week yeah but this was after like the first trimester of not eating and throwing right. and vomiting and then it quickly flipped and then i got an appetite and and this nurse was one of my favorites she was african-american and she just said jill you can't you know you can't gain this much weight in one week you're you know so small and you really don't want to gain a you know a whole lot of weight and i like went off on her i lost <laughs> it i wrote this in my my journal my pregnancy journal i was like <laughs> oh, i gained too much weight and you know and i also knew that i mean i was doing my reading 
I knew how much weight I could gain in my, in my pregnancy. And I knew that it was the beginning. And I knew that towards the end, I would probably stop gaining weight. And I was only supposed to gain 40 pounds and I gained exactly 40 pounds. Wow. And the last month of my pregnancy with the twin, it was all water uh, cause my legs were swollen. I couldn't put on my shoes. Um, so that's just an, an example. And I think you, when you have a relationship and you have the same person mm. with Amari, I had the same doctor okay. and, mm-hmm. she totally, and she was a black woman. I specifically picked her for that reason. Mm-hmm. And it was a diff, a totally different relationship and a different experience. Just hearing that and hearing how your first experience, you were in a clinic where you rotated, you know, between different medical professionals. For me being in the field, that is like a red flag because that interrupts continuity of care. Here we go. Um, So in order for you to develop a rapport with a patient, you have to, of course, have, yeah, you, have to you know, see regularly scheduled appointments. Yeah. Exactly. And I think for me, I don't really establish that, that rapport until maybe like third visit, second, third visit. And that's when I kind of start to feel more comfortable. We talk more, patient may share more. That's where it kind of promotes, you know, a better outcome in a sense for me. So that to me is like a red flag. And if that's kind of how medical practices are evolving, that could be part of this issue. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you don't know the patient, if you're just seeing them, not to say that you can't handle it based on chart notes, things of that nature. But I do feel that you do need to see someone more than once in order to really kind of have an understanding of, you know, a patient. So that was going to kind of be my question. So you said you were at a clinic where the staff rotated. Did the staff rotate within that clinic or were they rotating among many different no, just medical the- facilities? Just the one. <laughs> because I'm thinking, and again, you know, all of my medical knowledge comes from TV. I'm like, do they not have like shift meetings, staff meetings where they're like, this is so-and-so, this is the case, blah, 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 that, you know, she's having twins, um, came through fertility treatment, she's potentially high risk, she's also having a geriatric pregnancy, like, (laughs) right, I mean, like, yes, it's in the file, but you only have, like, two seconds, you pick up a chart, you walk in the room, and you're like, oh, you know, Mrs. Baker, blah, 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 is there not that, like, conversation or am I being just like a little no. Pollyanna in my thinking? No. So what you're talking about is report. So report happens in certain settings. So like mainly kind of like in hospital type settings, um, but it doesn't always happen in like a clinic setting. Sometimes we have interdisciplinary meetings. It just, it really just depends on the setting, but not, I haven't really experienced that. I've worked in uh, wound care clinics um, within the hospital and uh, I haven't really experienced a uh, report per se. Okay. So yes and no is if that kind of okay. answers. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I don't know, you know, I'm the lay one on the call. Y'all, y'all know, I don't have no, any it's not, it's not. So I asked the questions that I think re- the average people are thinking like, oh, wouldn't you yeah. have a conversation? Cause like, you know, I work in a corporate setting. We have staff meetings. And when I was with my entire, I'm in corporate communications and marketing. When I'm with my entire team, at least twice a month, we come together and we talk about what's on the docket of things that we need to do. What marketing campaigns are we running? What press releases are coming up? What internal communications do we need to discuss? So for me, I'm like communications and marketing in the grand scheme of things, it's trivial. Whereas in a medical setting, like these are people, these are their (laughs) lives. Wouldn't it warrant that you would want to have um, additional touch points, additional conversations and things like that? Just food for thought. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right answer. I don't know if it works, you know, especially if you have to cycle through X amount of patients per hour or whatever it is. I I have no idea. But I think a good takeaway point from that is that when you're, you find out you're pregnant and you're looking for a place to go for care, you can shop around, do your research. You don't have to go to the first place you went to. Yes. If you're not comfortable. If you don't just listen to your gut, like Sonora talked about so many times, and if you yeah. don't leave and know you have. Absolutely. Options. There's so- options. And you know what? I think like, you know, as a patient coming from a patient standpoint, I think that we don't often feel that there are options 
like it's not, you know, like how we would make a regular business decision. Mm -hmm. You know, I may try you out, I may interview you, but you can do the same thing with your health. It it, it is a business. And if you don't feel that you're being serviced in the right way, yeah. And if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't click for you, you got to go somewhere else, you know, because that could be life or death. So absolutely. To play devil's advocate. So me as a patient, I'm shopping around, right? I'm pregnant. Let's say it's once a month, (laughs) right? So I go to Uh my regular OBGYN. Mm -hmm. When I find out that I'm pregnant, he does, he or she does a pregnancy test. Some reason things aren't gelling. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna find a different doctor. Month two, I go to another doctor and I'm like, something off about this one too. Month three, I go to another doctor and I'm like, I don't know. Isn't that pretty much the same that the patient is doing as the doctors, for example, in Jill's um, first pregnancy example, in terms of cycling through. So you don't get that continuity of care. So while and I'm talking out of both sides of my face a little bit, but like yeah. I said, I am playing devil's yeah. advocate here. But like, if I'm not getting continuous care with one provider, is that not as damaging as if mm-hmm. the medical practitioners were cycling through as well? I, I have to agree because even in my sense, I had to, in my case, rather, I had to change doctors at 27 and a half weeks pregnant and I was scared to death. Just knowing what I know, you know what I mean? I was scared and because I'm like, God, they didn't follow me from the beginning. Then yeah. I also had to take the risk of, will someone else take me on this far mm-hmm. along? You know, and as Ado said, remember when Ado was on, she said she changed doctors at 40 weeks 40. Mm-hmm. and she had to like beg and plead for mm-hmm. the doctor to take her because it is, there is a risk here. They haven't followed you through the pregnancy they don't know, you know, if you had complications. I mean, you're giving patient, you're giving your history and then they may request your records, but there's still so much in between that right. they didn't have that time to discover. So yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Again, as for me, and I agree with both of you, I think in the end and the point of it all is that you just have to be comfortable. And if you're not comfortable with the person who is providing you with care, to me, it's like nothing else matters. So yeah, you yes. should shop around, you know, read those Yelp reviews because people do write yes. Yelp reviews on their doctors. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Find out, um, you know, talk to friends and find out what other uh, experiences people have had. Important. Yes. Word of mouth yeah. is definitely important. Word of mouth. That's Back right. Friends. Or recommendations or yes. who to go to or who not to go to. Right. Those are both important. Absolutely. Got my doctor at 27 and a half weeks because it was my cousin's doctor. So. I got my new endocrinologist because my coworker heard me reaming out my previous endocrinologist oh. in the office. Like I I went ham. I was like, this woman is <laughs> yes. here. And he was like, um, he was like, you know, I go to a weight management clinic and there's a whole endocrinology staff. Do you want to try them out? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I live in the Bronx. I don't want to come all the way to Manhattan. Best decision I ever made. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. all because he recommended that price. That's right. That's Best right. decision I ever made. Do you drive a Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, or Bentley? Then you should visit All Good Automotive. Expertise on luxury to foreign cars, domestic cars, SUVs, and trucks. It's all good with you, too. All Good Automotive in downtown Lawrenceville. 465 Malt Beach Street, Suite 110 in Lawrenceville, Georgia. From tune-ups, engine replacements, suspension work, and more. We do it all good. Specials on brakes starting at 150. Tune-up specials starting at 250. Take your mechanic needs to All Good Automotive. Book your appointments at allgoodauto.org or call us 770 770- Zero six nine five six eight three three. It's all good with all good. So right now, I'd like to take uh, a moment to introduce our guest, Amari Maynard. Amari's life partner, Shimani Gibson, gave birth on September 30th. She had a C-section. A few days after she returned home, she felt shortness of breath. Shimani started having problems breathing. She started feeling better. And then 12 hours later, she was gone on October 6, 2019. Shimani Gibson died of a pulmonary embolism. Shimani was 30 years old. Their newborn son, Kari, only spent two weeks of his life with his mother. 
We're going to be speaking with Amari, uh, Shimani's life partner, about his experience when Shimani passed and now raising their two children alone. If you could just kind of take us through what was happening, you know, what was happening leading up to, you know, the birth. Well, to start off, um, Kari is our second child. Our first child, Anari, we had in 2017. And um, that birthing process was in terms of Shimani's health was really good. It was awesome. You know, we were pretty well informed about how we wanted our experience to be and what we wanted it to be. As far as having Anari in the hospital, that was perfectly fine for us at the time, but we wanted to make sure that we had this proper support. So what we did was she found a lot of information about various doulas. We ended up picking up a, picking a doula ship and, and we, we went with them. So we had, um, we had them, it was a rotating um, it was a rotating kind of partnership that we had with these different doulas who we would see on a probably bi-weekly to a monthly basis. And of course, you know, as she came further along, we would go um, to our visits a little bit more regularly. But the thing about that was that each, just like everybody, everybody's different, you know, so each doula was different, you know, so we built relationships with one and then we would hope to see them again and we didn't, you know, so that was kind of the back, you know, the backlash of having that rotating doulaship. But the Good part about it was that when we did get to the hospital, we did have somebody who was on call with us for um, the entire time, you know, so it wasn't just one person kind of sitting and waiting and coaching us along, you know, because that can, of course, be exhausting depending on how long your birth might be, you know, so um, we had somebody on call and it was, they were um, in conjunction with the hospital as well. So there was no problems with them getting in, getting out, you know, they had a report, they both report the hospitals already so all the doctors and nurses, you know, knew them and understood what the, why they were there, what their purpose was, and I guess felt a little more comfortable to make sure that they can advocate for their clients, you know, um, the way they're supposed to. When we got to the hospital, we had to get an emergency C-section done with Anari because uh, uh, Shimani developed preeclampsia. I was about to say, I couldn't remember the name, but she developed pre preeclampsia. So that's right. Mm -hmm. um, after she, uh, after we got to the hospital, you know, we, um, we tried to, they had to induce her. We tried to wait for, you know, Anari to come out, you know, vaginally, but she wasn't dilating enough. Um, and I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit later. She wasn't dilating mm -hmm. enough. So uh, we ended up having to get a C-section. Long story short, Anari came out great. She, we, but we didn't really have a, a, um, a really good experience at that particular hospital because even though Anari was, I want to say she was eight pounds, maybe seven and a half pounds when she was born. Wow. We ended up, she ended up still in the NICU um, because they said that she didn't have um, her blood or sugar levels weren't uh, right. You know, so, okay. you know, and, and our understanding, you know, I, and at that time, Shimani, of course, wanted to just make sure that she was strictly breastfed, you know. So unfortunately, you know, we were, that was taken away from us when she got to make the mm. formula and making sure that sugar levels were fine before we were able to leave. Thankfully, that didn't necessarily deter Anari from wanting to breastfeed because, you know, she did eventually. But, um, you know, it, it just kind of turned us off. One, you know, just, of course, we, you know, it was great to have advocates there, but all in all, when it all came down to it, you know, it was was still kind of that, you know, that, that thing that happens at the hospital when you yeah. are at the hospital, you're, you're having yeah. birth, totally new, everything mm -hmm. that you've learned is kind of out the window. So you're like, yo, what do we do? How do we do it? And right. they're, they're doing paperwork in your face and they tell you to sign this. And if you don't do this, then this will happen. And, you know, so it was kind of like that snowball effect that, you know, let us kind of feel that made us kind of feel that even though we were in control and the community that we brought in was able to deal with it and handle it accordingly in the way that specifically that we wanted to. Fast forward two years later, uh, we had a car in 2019 and we ended up going with a different uh, midwifery program and a different doula. Uh, it was something that was more local. They were African-based. Um, it was cool because they offered programs where you could um, sit with other families who were actually going through the birthing process as well. So we did mm. that a couple of times a week. Well, not, excuse me, not a couple of times, a couple of times a month. Um, and then you also had your own individual visits. And the great thing about it is because, like I said, it was African-based. All the doulas, you know, they were Black sisters, um, amazing women. Um, but unfortunately... The downfall to that was that there are only, I want to say maybe one, two of the most um, specific midwifery services that are geared towards 
that are black owned and you know mm -hmm. in the tri-state area mm -hmm. um, so you know they've spread really thin you know they're spread really yes. thin they they have it's, they're dealing with a lot you know um it's dealing it's a lot to have to service an entire community when you're only but you know one or two or three people you know so absolutely um, you know, that was kind of the the downfall for that but mm -hmm. like i said the experience was amazing fast forward what we did this time is we we wanted to have a v-back which is a, a vaginal yes. birth after um, a c-section and we wanted to have an at-home birth so we got a mm. water birth got all the equipment to have the water birth at home um mm. doula, uh, midwives are on board with it making sure that they prepped us and gave us um you know the experience and the exercise and then made sure that we were on the dietary plan that we needed in order to make sure all of these things kind of went as smoothly as possible and you know like i said it was it was a great experience and the day came and um shimani's water broke and you know we were ready i set up the set up the room got the got the pool ready you know we were good to go we called the uh her midwife and we told her that you know she was contracting and this was this was probably like around two or three o'clock in the morning. And the midwife was like, you know, wait till the contractions get closer and then, you know, she'll come and, you know, we'll make make it happen. But as she kept going further along, the contractions kind of slowed down and they, they, we kind of were a little bit, um, you know, got a little bit nervous about that. You know, so yeah. that wasn't the normal ex kind of experience. A doula, um, I mean, a midwife told us that, you know, we need to wait a little bit longer, but if they don't start coming, then we need to go to the hospital. Um, we ended up having to go to the hospital the next day, I want to say close to that afternoon. It was kind of a long time to, to wait, but we we did. Mm. Um, so we, the hospital that we ended up going to though, they were, in terms of having natural births, they were kind of, they were top rated in the New York City area. So. You know, we were still, you know, excited to have, you know, a baby and have our mm -hmm. child have it naturally the way she wanted to, even though we couldn't have it at home necessarily. So right. you know, we um when we got to the hospital, they, you know, they did their best to make sure that, you know, we had that experience. Um and we they waited, they were pumping fluids in her to try to keep, you know, make sure that the babies, even though the water broke, make sure that there was still fluids in the baby's body and that everything was good. Again, unfortunately, she wasn't dilating enough. Um, and this was over a couple of hours now. So, you know, we had to go ahead and get another C section. And I think just kind of, you know, in hindsight and retrospect, just you know, with just the generational traumas that women have to deal with when giving birth to their, you know, to their children, you know, it's something that's, you know, held in the bodies for generations to come, you know. So I think that was really kind of one um, main reason that Shimani wasn't really dilating, just the traumatic experience of being, you know, a black mm. you know, in America. It's just a real thing. When we got to the C-section piece, we, again, we, you know, it was kind of unfolding where it was like, all right, Again, this is not in our hands the way we have wanted it to. So, you know, ultimately you want a healthy baby, you know, regardless of how the baby is birthed, you know. So that was what we were banking on um, at this point, you know. So um, when Shimani went in for the C-section, uh, she, um, she had webbing. And webbing is basically when they cut her open to get the baby out, the intestine kind of fused together. So we wanted to, it took them longer to get to the baby, one. And then two was when... They were giving her the um, IV. She complained the feeling like they like the fluids weren't going in, like there was a blood clot um, in her arm at the time. And you know that was kind of the first, again in hindsight and retrospect, that was kind of the first warning signs of what was to come. Um, we got Kari out. Kari was taken out. I want to say maybe about ten to fifteen minutes later, and then the doctor that we had. <laughs> um, um, decided that he felt the need to take out her fibroids as well. She had a couple of fibroids and if you have fibroids, you know, that's a separate, a totally separate surgery from having a, you know, a C-section done. So between the webbing and the fibroids and, you know, taking Kari out, you know, she was just open for too long. You know, after she was, after they sewed it back up, you know, she was, she was good. Kari was fine. He was eight, eight, and eight and change pounds. Um, healthy baby. So you know we were happy about that. All fingers all toes yes. were good. Yes. So um, and we all made it out the hospital. You know, which is also right. We all made it out. We all made it out safely. Shimani was 
um, was good. Kari was good. Um, but when prior weeks, you know, is when um, she kind of started experiencing shortness of breath, chest pains, um, couldn't really talk the way she was used to, couldn't really move around the way she was used to. And, um, you know, we thought it was from her being overactive, you know, but, um, you know, her mother, Shawnee Gibson is, you know, she's, um, she is in the birthing community for yes. years, you know, for years. So she's seen a lot of things and has experienced a lot of things through her own traumatic um, experiences giving birth, but also through the stories of people who have, you know, let her into their lives and told and shared with them their birthing story, her, shared with her their birthing stories. You know, the first thing she asked was, you know, this sounds like preclamps, not preclamps, excuse me, this sounds like um, a pulmonary embolism you might be having. Yeah. Experiencing. And they had yes. conversations about that before, but, um, you know, Shamani was like, I don't really think so. You know, when she went to the doctors, they they didn't they didn't feel like she was having one. We went to the doctors, I want to say about three different, three separate times um, before she passed away within the two weeks. One was to for them to check out Kari to try to get them on their nutrition plan. The other one was to get our paperwork together in terms of um, getting his, you know, social security and stuff like that taken care right. of. Also to um, get uh, Shimani staples checked out. And for each mm -hmm. time that we went, you know, we spoke to somebody, we definitely let them know what the symptoms and the signs that we were seeing and just kind of wanted some insight and perspective. Um, every time we went in though, it was, it was, you know, it's okay, you'll be all right. If anything gets worse, you know, just call us up. And then when we did call, it was it was pretty much the same the same conclusion like you know um, you know you just need to rest you just need to stop moving around it and you know she was a very active woman so we thought that might have been the case of her just being kind of more active than she needs to be um, especially because you know this was within these last three years now her second birth but you know unfortunately that that wasn't the case you know she was in hindsight having pulmonary embolism having experiencing blood clots running through her body. On October 3rd, she um, was having really bad chest pains and couldn't get up the steps in our house. And, um, you know, we was, that's when we were really kind of nervous and really trying to figure out, all right, what should we do? We called her mom and she, her mom had people come over the house to make sure that Shimani was, you know, just able to lay up and relax and have people come over to, to cook, clean for those next two days for the third and the the, excuse me, the 4th and the 5th of October. And on, on the 5th, we had Shamani's mom came over, her aunt was over, and her god sister came to the house. And we were all just kind of chilling, hanging out, you know, taking care of the babies, watching TV. And, um, you know, Shamani was like, um, you know, she was all right. And then I want to say like around maybe about seven, eight o'clock, she was like, yeah, I need to go to the hospital. Like, I'm not feeling good, you know? So, you know, and if you know Shamani, she's not, if she's saying that, then you know it's, it's time to get up and, and really start moving, you know, because, you know, she's really just kind of resilient and, you know, um, not the really type of person to ask for anything outright that way, you know? So as I'm getting her bags together, and getting everything together to go to the hospital, you know, her mom and her aunt just scream out to me hysterically. And um, I run into the bedroom and Shimani's going into cardiac arrest. And, you know, her eyes are rolling in the back of her head. She's convulsing. Um, she's, it's, it's a, it was the visually, it was, it was, it's traumatic. It was a, it was a traumatic experience. Um, so we call 911. Now, the EMTs came. We have a nebulizer in the house, so I tried to use a nebulizer to kind of try to get her breathing kind of going, but I mean, it, it wasn't working. It didn't really work. She came to eventually for a little while. The EMTs came, they tried to take her pulse, and then she went into cardiac arrest again. And during this whole time, like the EMT workers are like, you know, like telling her to hold still and relax and calm down and while they're trying to take her pulse and take her vitals. You know, but, you know, at this point, you know, she's literally fighting for her life. So, you know, that's the last thing, you know, anybody right. can do, you know, if they're fighting for their life. Absolutely. And, you know, we're telling them, you know, we think she's having a pulmonary embolism, uh, you know, and they're asking us, EMTs at this point, her, her, so her heart stops and she stops moving and, um, 
you know, they call more people and the fire department comes, more EMT workers come. And, you know, as they're coming in in stages, you know, they're asking us the same questions. And one specific question that they continually ask us was, was she on any drugs? Did she take any drugs? Um, are you sure she didn't take any drugs? Like, we're telling them, like, she just literally gave birth two weeks ago. Like, she, and if you know Shimani, she doesn't do anything. She doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't take aspirin. She's just not, she's never been that type of type of woman. Um, specifically because, you know, her, her mother is, you know, is a social worker, she's a therapist. You know, she's many different layers. There's many different layers to Shawnee Gibson. And mm -hmm. in turn, there are many different layers to her daughters and her son, you know. So Shamani, you know, understood, like, understood the effects that these things can have, you know, on a person, you know. So that was just never her, you know, it's never what she was into. You know, so um, um, long story short, um, she coded, they eventually were able to get a pulse. They couldn't get her heart necessary to keep, to, to beat to where they could feel it, but they could feel a pulse. So um, we were rushed to the hospital and we live in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. So the hospital, the closest hospital to us is a hospital that is known for you not wanting to go to. The hospital has been divested for for years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's almost, I don't even want to say it, but it's almost a death sentence once you get into that place because there's just no resources and they don't have the the um, infrastructure to take care of people properly, you know? So that yeah. was pretty much the same thing in this case. We went there and... Um, they didn't have the, the facility, they didn't have, they had the facility, of course, but they didn't have the unit, they didn't have the infrastructure, they didn't have the tools that they needed in order to remove a blood clot. All they could really do was give her blood thinners, but at this point, they needed something, of course, more aggressive, yeah. and, you know, something a little bit more, a lot more urgent. And the only way for her to get to the hospital that had one, which is, I want to say Kings County, mm -hmm. the hospital is probably the closest one that has that unit. Um, she needed to be breathing and also right. um, needed to be breathing and her pulse needed to be, you know, moving on, on her own. And, um, you know, she never made it to, to that point where they can transfer her 20 minutes away. And uh, of course, you know, in hindsight, you know, that would be the first place that I would tell, would have told them to go. Um, and even though she coded and even though, you know, things were bleak, I would have at least felt a lot better if we had the opportunity to try to make sure that we put her in the best place to make sure that, you know, she would still be here today in order to enjoy her family. Um, she stayed in that hospital for almost 12 hours on um, pretty much the respiratory machine to help her breathe, or, you know, assist, assist her to breathe. And um, yeah, she, after a while, what ended up happening to happen was, you know, her, her she was just pretty much kind of downgrading and downgrading. And I want to say the September 6th that morning, um, she coded again and, you know, they were giving her chest compressions for like literally an hour you know they were rotating doctors and nurses rotating um you know, i want to say every two to five minutes just giving her chest compressions chest compressions for at least an hour and she ended up passing away october 6th at around 11 a.m yeah and i mean there were just so many so many layers to this story and so many yeah points in this story where this just didn't have to this is didn't have to be the the final outcome there were many times where you know it would have taken just talking to the right doctor, having a conversation with the right yeah. person, you know, engaging with the right, you know, hospital, you know, and she would still be here today and, and she'd be fine, you know, but, um, you know, that is the plight and, you know, you don't know until you know, you know, so I didn't know, yeah. that, you know, maternal mortality and maternal morbidity was such, was so rampant in the black, brown, and indigenous community. We don't talk, we don't talk about it either. Yeah, exactly, yeah. at all, at all, you know, and until, you know, Shamani passed and people started opening up to me specifically about conversations that they've had with other people or things that has happened to them personally. Or yes. A family member, you know, so, um, you know, since then, you know, I've been on kind of my own crusade to, 
help, you know, one really just to shed light, you know, to shed light on, on what, you know, our women are experiencing and, you know, to bring awareness, because again, this is stuff that is easily preventable, but, you know, in my personal opinion, you know, it's, um, you know, it's just that, that's, it's, it's a part of the systematic cog in order to, to really break down the black and brown family, you know, to keep us at a level where, we can be absolutely, you know, you know, absolutely, you know, absolutely. So, um, again, you know, so I, like I said, I, I do what I can do in my own ways to make sure that you know I, we continue to have this conversation, and I will continue to have this conversation because you know, of course, I don't want my daughter to have to be put in this situation, but anybody's daughter, anybody's sister, anybody's mother, anybody's aunt, you know, because this is this is another piece to that puzzle that they need in order to keep us, you know, in a stagnant state. Well, thank you so much for just being so vivid in the way you described um, what happened, because it really gives us a total picture of what happened to her. For me, every time I hear your story, every time I read it, I hear something else that kind of sticks out to me about, like you said, if someone else could have reacted differently. Like for me, just hearing you talk about the EMTs, you know, saying to her, don't move, you know, stand still, or them even harping on the fact of, or the question of, was she on some type of drugs? You know, it just, it makes me angry because it's a lack of training, a lack of professionalism. Um, and all of those things, you know, that, that lack led to her not being here today, you know, and it's just, it's very frustrating. It's, it makes me angry. I really just commend you and applaud you for having the strength you know, to, to, to carry this torch because it's, it's so necessary, Amari. It's so, it's so necessary, you know? So, I mean, for me, like the EMTs, I'm just like, I can't get over that part right there, you know, um, especially in light of, you know, um, maternal mortality. Now the number is eight in New York city. So for every one white woman who dies, eight black women die during childbirth right now. And so um, knowing that this happened to you in New York City, all of the complications that could have possibly arose, they, they came. It's mind boggling because again, here you have two educated people, you know, um, just listen to you speak, you know, I can tell who you are, you know what I mean? Like I can tell just your experience. You, you looked at your first birth experience, you, you evaluated that, you tried to create something different. You know, you actually went the steps, uh, you took the steps of having a home birth. You know, I wanted to have an at home birth, but I was scared of what could be. And so I never actually followed through with all of that. So like hearing all that tells me exactly who you two are and who Shimani was. I've never really brought this up, but I, at the time, thank you, baby. At the time, I didn't know how prevalent this was. Even after she passed, so like I said, they were they were resuscitating her for a good hour, and you know, right. giving her chest compressions and also pumping her with adrenaline. So, like mm -hmm. I've literally watched her go from I wanted I wanted about 140, 50 pounds to 170, 80 pounds within the within an hour, right? On the um, death certificate, what they wanted to put, or what they ended up putting was that she was obese. At the time, like I didn't really think anything of it, you know, but after having conversations with, with um, Shawna, you know, we realized that, you know, one reason why they would put that is then to give um, a reason to say like she passed away because of X, Y, and Z complications. Absolutely. Like, she wasn't taking care of herself physically and nurturing her body properly. And therefore X, Y, and Z happened. And this was a result of that, you know? So it was just like things like that, you know, where they really, you know, like really pull these strings and really try to pull the yeah. over your eyes in order to then of course save their own butts, you know, but, you know, to also, um, you know, put you in a position where you can't necessarily get the justice that you d deserve. Absolutely. You know? uh, when these, hospitals are essentially trying things out on you know or, or um, just not giving you the proper care and doing the things that are of code you know as yeah. far as doctors and nurses are 
are supposed to take care of their patients. But you know, you're you're 100 on point because anyone would know that has been a part of a code that excess fluid is actually fluid overload, um, and it's due to, like you said, pumping the patient full full of fluids, things of that nature. And so that is crazy that they would actually say that she was obese. And right. you're right; it almost you know, sounds like you bring like, that up because when yeah. I was doing the research for the stats, one of the reasons that Act, the actual numbers for maternal mortality are probably not accurate because of death certificates mm -hmm. and what is put on the death certificate after a woman dies mm -hmm. after, you know, they give birth. So the fact that you just said that just puts two and two together. And so this yeah, is it gives credence. happening so people can try to get off and not take accountability for these, you know, these systems and the doctors and providers, like not providing the proper care during pregnancy, during delivery, after delivery. So for you to say that it happened in, in, your, in this your case, case Michael, that's insane. Yeah. Um, so the numbers are probably higher mm -hmm. than what they are. Yeah, well, and they went into CYA mode. The hospital yeah, went into definitely. CYA mode, you know? What's yeah, no interesting problem. is I'm technically obese and I take care of myself. Like I'm obese because of a hormonal condition. So whether, mm -hmm. no matter what I eat, if I exercise or not, like I could breathe air and it's like, oh, step on a scale tomorrow, additional two pounds. So it's like obesity really... <laughs> is making my blood boil. Cause like, mm -hmm. that's really is not and necessarily an explanation or an excuse right. because there are a number of reasons why people, or in this case, a woman can be a certain weight. Hello. She gave birth two weeks ago. She might still be carrying right. around some postpartum yeah. weight. Like Absolutely. use your brain. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, so. I yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to agree with my co-hosts, it, it is nuts. While obesity can be a contributing factor to complications, it is not always the cause, you know? And so it, yeah, it just, it just, it really does anger me to just hear how Shimani was mishandled, you know, almost every step of the way in a sense, you know? And I used to live on Hancock and Nostrand. So I know what you're talking about, Amari, in terms of that hospital yeah. and the you know resources available so it's like damn if you do damn if you don't like we're in neighborhoods where we don't have adequate access to decent yeah. health care mm -hmm. you know what i mean That's like right. yeah like we we why you know and it's and it's so sad because these things mean life or death you know what i mean and then her not being stable enough to transfer you know it's just like man, you know, it's so sad because like you said, maybe if she could have gone there, but I can just tell you that in an emergent situation, sometimes you don't have choice of hospital. Sometimes yeah. you have to go to the nearest hospital, period. Especially like now during COVID, patients did not have any say so as to where they preferred to go. They had to go to the nearest hospital and part partly because of the overwhelming, um, mm -hmm. you know, calls um, to EMT and yeah. stuff. So it's just like, there's so many factors that we can't even control, you know what I mean? Um, that are playing such a big part in these outcomes, you know? Um, I totally get what you're saying, like in terms of the nearest hospital versus the hospital of choice. And I just wanted to clarify the hospital where Shimani was being treated after delivery is that the same hospital where she delivered um no, that, was, that was a different hospital oh, okay different hospital, yeah. and the the hospital where she delivered is that the hospital where she would have gotten the treatment that could have potentially um helped save her life or was it a different no, hospital it would have been a different hospital oh okay so okay. the two hospitals that are in bed style are the two that we ended up going to but the one that we needed to go to in terms of like well king's the one that had the the unit is further down into Flatbush.
Did you know that essential oils are instrumental in helping you live a physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy lifestyle in a safe, natural, and effective way? Well, let Dr. Zupenda Davis Shine introduce you to the amazing world of essential oils and all of their positive benefits, especially when it comes to easing pain, relieving anxious feelings, and assisting with sleep issues. Reach out to Lady Z today by email or direct message on Instagram, and she'll help you reach your health goals and address any ailments that you have. That's Lady Z's Oils, L A D. Y Z S O I L S at gmail.com or at Lady Z's Oils on Instagram. For more information or to place an order, visit my.doterra.com slash Lady Z's Oils. Another thing yeah. that took out mm-hmm. for me, and I think this mm-hmm. is maybe the fifth time hearing this, mm-hmm. story, it's them removing her fibroids without consent so that just makes me think about Henrietta Lacks um yes and again 2020 so how did they do that with that I don't understand I don't understand that because even like is, when I was got this my, a conversation I like after see my you, you think you're doing me a favor me right then and there what you're saying is really key because consent could she even <laughs> consent Right. While she was under the influence exactly. of anesthesia and exactly. things of that nature, could Amari consent for her? Right. Like these are all these are all really good questions. Um, I've seen things like this before. Usually they're discussed prior to, you know, maybe the, you know, right. physician is aware of the fibroids and they have a plan right. to right. do this. Um, it doesn't seem like that in this case. Yeah, I could be wrong, but was this a plan? No, well, this yeah. was not something that was talked about before. This okay. Was, this was not it. Yeah, not at all. I don't know. I don't know why the doctor decided to do this. Um, they can't do that without. They didn't speak to you about it, Amari? No. no. They didn't ask me. I mean, uh, they didn't ask Shimani. She was. No. Nah. Right. She was awake, possibly, but, but sedated, so she couldn't yeah, have consented. Exactly. You know I'm not what I mean? Consented right. to anything, yeah. <laughs> like, but you can. That's actually this is illegal. What right. like, like you know what I mean. So to me, and unless the fibroids presented like imminent danger, like maybe one of them were, was bleeding, you know. But I would think you would have known that, you know, Amari. So like, I'm just, I don't even understand. Like, you know, it's and just I to just clarify. Don't understand. Just to clarify for our listeners, the doctor who delivered um, Kari, mm-hmm. so did the C-section, delivered Kari, was that doctor your wife's um, gynecologist or OB? No, not at all. Like this. Is oh, okay. A, this is, I, I've never seen him before that and I never saw him after. Um, mm-hmm. he, he came, did, did his job and, and that was it. Um, it was definitely not Shimani's gynecologist at all. And that's wild to me because I'm like, I think where you and Sonora were both going in terms of maybe you were aware of this beforehand. So if that was the gynecologist and you've been talking to the gynecologist prior to getting pregnant right. about having these fibroids and the gynecologist is like, you know what, so that we don't have to go in and do another procedure, let's do this now. It's something we discussed beforehand nah, I don't know you, like you, it's, it's Um, just, it's, it's too many things. It literally, literally too many things. Like Omari, you never spoke a truer word when you said that there are so many layers to this experience Yeah, because it really is multi-layered and on each layer, you can see where just deciding to do a, instead of B had a different outcome. And yeah. we could sit here and play, how do you say, like Monday morning quarterback? I don't know. Right. I think that's the phrase. I'm right. not I'm not American. I don't understand football. So I try <laughs> with the idioms to draw people in. We could sit here. Yes, hindsight is twenty twenty and all of that. But it's like mm-hmm. absent knowing all you can do is question if this, then would that have happened? And if not this, would it not have been that? So it, it just really makes you wonder. Um and even in this instance, Omari was present and he was there with Shamani and he's advocating to the best of his ability and it still fell on deaf ears. Even with um, 
Shawnee, Shamani's mother, being someone who is connected to the birthing community and has some inclination in the way of postpartum conditions and prenatal conditions and those types of things, even that didn't necessarily help. So again, here it is, like regardless of your education, where you're living, all of those other demographics we ran down. Exactly. It's still like, it it makes it feel like it's a crapshoot. Even if I wanted to have another child, let me tell you, it's not happening because I would be petrified, petrified, yeah. petrified. That's what you don't, I, like I've spoke to many women who are pregnant and like, yo, I'm so scared. I don't want to have this child. Well, you know, like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I, I don't know if I'm, a, you know, <laughs> be get out alive, you know, and when somebody right. says, yeah. you know, it's, it's heart wrenching, you know, and you don't, I, you know, I, I'm telling my story. I don't want women or families to feel like, yo, we're not having kids, you know, like, because um, right. and that's not what it's about. You know, it's honestly, it's just the opposite. You know, you want right. to make sure that you um, do your best to control your, your situation. But of course you want to know, you just want to be in the know, you know, <laughs> you want to be in the know because you want to know right. honestly sometimes it's even better to be ignorant and not know right and just go in <laughs> blind right you right know? ignorance Which is what you bliss. always say sonora <laughs> like sometimes you <laughs> wish you didn't know what you know yeah, exactly. it's a hard you know it's a hard pill to swallow but i agree you know but amari your, your story doesn't make me afraid it just like you said, it makes me aware Man. of the dangers mm-hmm. you know what i mean and that's why i think it's so powerful that you share it um, because now families will have more tools to protect themselves. You know what I mean? You gave us so many different checkpoints. Seriously. You talked about you talked about the doctor's appointments, her follow up care, and how she kept saying, "I'm having difficulty breathing." You know what I mean? Like, so I'm just like, why did it have to take so many times? You yeah. know, for someone to take that serious. We also yeah. know why. I mean, part of that is also because historically, and even still now, as being a professor of medical students, there's recent literature that still shows that medical residents believe that Black people have less, feel less pain than white people. And that medical students believe that Black children feel less pain than white children. And they're surveyed over and over again, and they say the same things over and over again. And so in practice, these are the things that, that, occur and these are the reasons why when we go to the doctor we have to say three four times and we've all had these I've had these same experiences in my with my kids Mm -hmm. and going in and me knowing I wasn't going to dilate and 14 hours of of um of labor and I only dilated I think one centimeter and I and I said, can I, can we get started with this C-section? And they were like, no, you're not dilated enough yet. I'm not going to dilate. I'm not going to dilate. I didn't dilate for 36 hours with my twins, two centimeters and 36 hours. So 14 hours, mm-hmm. one centimeter, that's all you're going to get from me. Mm-hmm. Can we please <laughs> get this started? Yeah. Like, I don't want to be here any longer than I have to be. And that's straight up. <laughs> Uh, how I how I was, I, you know, when I when I talk to you know white counterparts of my white friends of mine and their birthing experiences, I do not hear these stories. Please follow a tribe called Fertility on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Feel free to DM us with your questions, thoughts, or share your fertility story. For more information on your amazing podcast hosts, please visit www dot a tribe called fertility dot com. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. It really helps the show and we welcome the feedback. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so that you know when we're dropping new content.